So, hi everyone, I want to thank you all for coming to my master's project in report defense. Uh, my research project is on the monotonic and cyclic response of single shear cold form steel to steel connections and steel to steel connections. So, my project is part of a larger AISI project that is focused on providing an analysis framework for the a framework for the seismic analysis of cold form steel buildings. Hysteretic nonlayer models of cold form steel axial members, flexural members, and beam column members have already been completed. So screw fastened connections, which is the focus of my project, is like the last piece of the puzzle. Before I get started with my research, I want to really thank my research team, um, Robert Cole, Francis Lee, and Linia Lee. They've put in a lot of time and effort, and without their help, I wouldn't have been able to finish all my experiments. My work has been documented in two conference papers. The first one was submitted uh, earlier this semester to the International Colloquium on Sterility and Ductility of Steel Structures, and this documented the steel-to-steel -steel test. And the next one, which will be submitted very soon, is uh, to the 23rd International Specialty Conference on Cold Form Steel Structures, and this will be on the sheathing-to-steel test. Here's an outline of uh, my presentation today. I will begin with a brief introduction and then move on to the experimental program, talk about the monotonic and cyclic backbones, um, discuss the three different type of models that we developed for pinching model. Uh, that's the backbone parameter, fastener, screw shear, and whole elongation model, and then move on to my conclusions and future work. So cold form steel buildings are becoming more and more prevalent in today's society, and screw fasteners play a very important role in how the gravity and lateral system of the building behaves. And for whole building seismic analysis to be possible and accurate, we need a full connection response characterization. And this includes strength and stiffness degradation and energy dissipation. This work on cold form steel has been years in the making and spans many different universities and experts in the field. For example, we have colleagues at Johns Hopkins University that have worked on cyclic strength and stiffness degradation and nonlinear dynamic time history analyses. We also have um, previous and current Virginia Tech students working on the initial stiffness and post-peak response for different fasteners, the parameterization of monotonic backbone responses, and pitching material models. So my part of the project builds on all this existing research, and it proposes backbone parameter models, fastener screw shear models, and whole elongation models. Now I'll talk about our experimental program. So these are our test matrices. Um, the first one is the steel to steel test, and the second one is our sheathing to steel test. And this diagram here tells you uh, what we mean when we say ply one and ply two. So ply one is just the ply that's in contact with the fastener head. So for our steel to steel test, um, we varied six different ply thicknesses and three different fasteners and subjected each type of combination to three trials of both the monotonic and cyclic loading. And this resulted in 222 tests. For the sheathing test, we used three different types of sheathing, oriented strand board, which is also known as OSB, structure one plywood, and paper laminated gypsum. And for each sheathing type, we used three different thicknesses. Um, for the sheathing test, we varied five different steel ply thicknesses, uh, three fasteners for the OSB and the plywood, and just one for the gypsum. So this came out to 78 OSB tests, 78 plywood tests, and 30 gypsum tests, which is a grand total of 408 tests. Now I want to briefly talk about our test naming convention, because I do use this throughout the presentation. So the first thing you see, uh, the first four values corresponds to the ply one and ply two naming. And this means uh, either the thickness of the steel ply in mills. And if it's a sheathing ply, we have a designation system where one means the thinnest, two is the medium thickness, and three is the thickest. The next two values uh, correspond with the fastener. And then we have our loading, which is monotonic or cyclic, and then the trial number. So here are two examples. The first one is, uh, is a steel to steel combination. So you have a 43 mil steel ply one and then a 54 mil steel ply two, a number 10 fastener, and the second of three monotonic tests. And for this one, we have um, a plywood medium thickness, so the two means medium thickness, the B means plywood, and then we have a 33 mil steel ply two with a number eight fastener, and the first cyclic test of three trials. And if this is too much to remember, all you need to know is that if there are a bunch of numbers, it's steel to steel, P means plywood, O means OSB, and G means gypsum. So here's our experimental setup. We're using the MTS Insight standard length material testing system, which is located in the creep room at the lab. In the system, there's a 150 kilonewton load cell, which is located up here. And this measures the applied force on the specimen at an accuracy of 0.1 kilonewtons. There's also an internal LVDT located here. And this measures the cross-set displacement with an accuracy of plus or minus 0.1 millimeters. What's unique about our test setup is we have these two aluminum window fixtures. And the reason for this is 
This design is to allow you to observe the specimen while the test is going. And these prongs from the window um, provide lateral restraint so the plies don't separate or move out of plane. Here you can see we have these four red sticker targets and this is used with our non-contact measurement system to measure the relative displacement delta. Uh, here's a test set. Here's a picture of our test setup. So you can see the camera is set up over here to face these four red targets that I mentioned earlier. We're using a Microsoft LifeCam Cinema HD 720 pixel video camera, which records at 30 frames per second. So while a test is ongoing, we'll have the camera recording uh, these targets. And after the test, we take the videos and post-process them in a custom MATLAB code to calculate the delta. This custom MATLAB code was, uh, valid, was developed and validated by a previous Virginia Tech student, and it has an accuracy of 0.1 minutes. So because our cameras record at 30 frames per second and then our MATLAB code uh, does a frame by frame analysis, we have data acquisition rate of 30 hertz. Here you can see um, a screenshot of what the post-processing looks like in MATLAB. So this is just one frame. And what it does per frame is it picks up any red targets. So here there are four red targets. And for each target, it records the X coordinate and the Y coordinate of the centroid, the areas of each target, and the timestamps of the frame. So the output of our MATLAB code is a .mat file with all this data. And then down here is where we calculate the relative displacement. So the first thing we do is get the distance between the top and bottom targets, which is the displacement in pixels. And then we use this ratio on the right-hand side to convert from pixels to millimeters. So we take the area of the target, which is 19 millimeters in diameter, and then we take the areas of the first 50 data points and average that to get the, area, the average area in pixels. And we square root this so we can get this um, displacement in millimeters. Here are our specimen dimensions. Um, what you will notice is that we have a 13 millimeter diameter hole uh, two at, for the bottom of the ply two and three at the top of ply one. And these will have 13 millimeter diameter bolts that um, connects it to the test setup and creates a bearing connection. And you see here we have a prescribed overlapping area. And at the center of this area is where we drive the fastener. These are the fasteners that we use for our tests. The steel to steel number eight were donated by Elko Construction Products, and the remaining fasteners were donated by Simpson Strong Tag. And you can also see illustrations of what the fasteners look like. So basically, we use three different types of fasteners for the steel and three different types of fasteners for the wood sheathing. And the same size fastener, but it varied just depending on which uh, thickness steel we were using. So as I mentioned earlier, we varied six different uh, steel ply thicknesses, and these plies were provided by Clark Deertrick. And for each ply thickness, we ran three tensile coupon tests uh, in accordance with ASTM, and these are the results that we got. During the testing, we actually were running low on steel, so we had to order a second batch, and this is the table you see on the bottom. And you can see here that the yield and ultimate and the percent elongation at fracture are all in the same range, except for the 43 ply from the first batch. Uh, it yielded a pretty high yield stress and ultimate stress in a fracture at a much smaller elongation than the others. For our sheathing ply material properties, we ran dowel bearing tests uh, in accordance with ASTM D5764. So we have these specimens of uh, 50 by 62 millimeters, and then we have a 9.5 millimeter diameter hole drilled through it. And then we have this dowel um, at the same diameter that's fed through the specimen and these steel angle fixtures. So when you set up the specimen, it's just, it's hanging here, and then the crosshead is lowered until it makes contact and applies the force, and then it bears through this length. So here are examples of the stress-strain curves that we got. Um, as you can see, the gypsum is the weakest, which we would expect, and plywood is the strongest. From these stress-strain curves, we obtained the materials, of, the material properties of interest. So for modulus of elasticity, we fit a line to that initial linear portion, and that slope is what we took as the modulus of elasticity. And then we offset that line by 5% of the dowel diameter. And the intersection of that fit line with the load deformation curve is the yield load. And then we divide this by the dowel bearing area to get our yield stress. And then the ultimate stress is just the peak stress of the stress strain curve. And here are just the material properties that we found um, summed up. We ran about five samples per thickness, some were a little bit more. And you can see again here that Gypsum was the weakest and plywood was the strongest. Now I'll talk about our monotonic and cyclic backbones. So this is our backbone nomenclature. Um, this is inspired by Ibarra, Medina, and Kowinkler. There are five regions. You have an elastic region, hardening region, peak, post-peak, and residual. 
And then there are four main points of our backbone. The first one is the yield point, which is um, FY and delta Y. We have our peak point, um, FC and delta C, post peak FR and delta R, and our last point FF, which we set to be zero, and delta F. So we get backbones for both the monotonic and the cyclic loadings. And then we use these backbones to obtain our loading protocols. Both our monotonic and cyclic loading were um, displacement controlled. So for the monotonic, Monotonic, we kept it constant at 0 0.025 millimeters per second. And for the cyclic, we adopted the FEMA 461 quasi static cyclic deformation control testing protocol. And what this prescribes is um, two cycles of equal displacement per step. And then with each step increase, you get a displacement amplitude increase of 40%. For our test, we anchored um, the displacement at the second step, which is the beginning of the third cycle. And the reason why we did this is uh, this is hypothesized to be the beginning of the fastener damage state. And our anchor displacement is calculated by getting the displacement associated with 40% of the peak load in the elastic region based on the monotonic backbone. So here are some example backbones. It's the projector. It's uh, so real hard to see. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, you kind of see them. <laughs> they're more gray on the computer. But uh, so here are some example backbones. If you start from the top left and Clockwise, we have a steel combination, gypsum, plywood, and OSB. So for the steel, the typical failure modes that we would see were fastener shear, uh, fastener pullout, or fastener bearing. So the example that I've shown here is a fastener shear failure. And you can see that the post-peak behavior is different than our backbone nomenclature. And that's because once you hit peak, it just um, the load just immediately drops because there's nothing carrying the load anymore. And then it levels off at a negligible amount of load. So you can kind of see it there. Um, so for this reason, we developed these backbone parameter models separately for the pullout and bearing cases and then for the shear cases. For the gypsum, we typically saw a bearing failure because the gypsum board is so weak in comparison with the steel ply, so it, the fastener just bears through the board. And you can see that here. Um, there's like a vertical drop in load, and that's when the fastener has completely made it through the board. For the OSB and the plywood, we would typically see fastener shear and fastener pullout, and both these cases here show fastener pullout. Um, as soon as the load initiates, the fastener tilts into the wood, and then it bears on the wood until it pulls out of the steel ply. And then you can, you can see that with the vertical drop in loads over here. So one thing that's really important um, for our future pinching models is cyclic strength and stiffness degradation. So here you can see we have a plywood combination, and it's very obvious that once you hit peak, there is a lot of strength degradation. And you can even compare at these end cycles, um, the reloading stiffness here is degrading based on this uh, initial stiffness of the backbone. So we do see strength and stiffness degradation for plywood. For OSB, we are seeing the same thing. Um, the load does, uh, the load drops after the peak, and then we do see, again, that stiffness degradation between the first elastic <laughs> backbone segment and the uh, ending cycles. For steel combination, again, we do see some strength degradation, but there seems to be not as much stiffness degradation in comparison with the OSB and the plywood. And then for gypsum, we actually see very minimal, if you can see the peaks of the cycles here, there's very minimal strength degradation as it goes down until it bears through. And even with the stiffness, there's minimal stiffness degradation. And we think this is because when the fastener is bearing on the gypsum, you're just crushing the gypsum and uh, just breaking off pieces. So the damage from the fastener doesn't propagate to the rest of the board like it does with OSB or plywood or steel. And here, um, I plotted them on the same scale so you can get a more equal comparison. So these, um, strength and stiffness degradation parameters are really important to include in our pinching model because it captures what would happen under, for example, an earthquake load. So as a side note, all the backbones and all the raw data are available online um, to the public if you have this link. So this link, uh, if you go to this link, you will come to this page and there are four folders for the different material tests. And if you went into one of them, for example, steel to steel, you would get a cyclic uh, or cyclic and a monotonic folder, and this is also in the other material folders. And then if you go into any of the folders, you would get um, all the combinations for the, for example, this is in the cyclic folder. And in these folders, you would get the trials that we ran. And then if you click any of the trials, you get four files. So the first one is a .mat file with all the raw, raw 
all the raw load deformation data and the backbone data. And then there's a plot in PDF form. And then we have two text files, one for the backbone and one for the load displacement um, in case someone doesn't have MATLAB on hand. And now I'll talk about our parameter models that we obtained from the backbones. So we developed this non-dimensional parameter side to be able to describe any connection material, uh, connection test. And this is applicable to any material given that you know these material properties. So you can see it is um, a relationship between the fastener shear strength, FSS, and the ply bearing strength, which is the thickness of the ply times the thread diameter times the ultimate stress. And we found that an exponential fit fit our data the best with alpha and beta as our trend parameters. We developed models for the force and the stiffness with the idea that if you want displacement, you can, do, you can use a relationship that displacement is equal to force divided by, that stiffness is equal to force divided by displacement. And then for our forces, we normalize by the fastener shear strength. And for the stiffness, we normalize by Ka, which is the axial stiffness of the plies treated as springs in series, assuming a rigid connection. So this table over here are the trend parameters for all of our backbone parameters for all the tests that we ran. So that includes steel and machining. So here you can see our trend plot uh, for Fy, which is the yield point. And what we notice uh, that's very important from our plots is that ply bearing strengths play a very important role in um, the strength and stiffness, which you will see later, of our connection. So if you increase your ply bearing strength, so that is this portion here. So that if you increase the denominator, I mean, yeah, if you increase the den denominator, you get a smaller psi and your strength will converge to FSS, which is the fastener shear strength. Um, so when you, once you get thicker plies and um, a weaker fastener, your strength will go towards the strength of the fastener. And you can also see here that for the FY, there's um, very minimal degradation from the monotonic response and the cyclic response. And here you can see our four plots uh, for the different materials. Again, it follows the same trend with the ply bearing strengths, and we do see that minimal uh, cyclic degradation from the monotonic response to the uh, from yeah from the monotonic response to the cyclic response. Um, you can see here that plywood does reach a little bit higher yield loads than the OSB, and that's expected since OS, uh, plywood is stronger. This is our FC trend plot, which is the peak load, and um, we see that same trend with the ply bearing strengths and the same trend of the minimal cyclic degradation. And here you can see, here you can see that um, again, as you increase the ply bearing strengths, uh, you get a decrease in size and then you converge to uh, one, which would mean FSS. And then when you um, decrease your ply bearing strengths, which means you get thinner plies, um, you are seeing a decrease in your strength. And lastly, we have our initial elastic stiffness plot. And um, what was very interesting about this is that, um, kind of counterintuitively, the cyclic Ke, so the cyclic stiffness was, a, was bigger than the monotonic stiffness, um, about two times as much. And we hypothesize that this is because um, in the first initial cycles of the fastener being loaded, it, the threads lock into the plies, which makes a stiffer connection in the beginning. And here you can see, again, our different materials. Um, for gypsum, we didn't have as many specimens uh, as the others. So it was there's a bit more scatter, and it's harder to fit a trend. But you can still see the monotonic is at about 0.25, and the cyclic is at 0.5. So it still follows that um, almost double increase in stiffness. And you can also see this in our other cases. So here, when you um, increase your ply bearing strengths and your side decreases, you are converging to Ka. So that means uh, you're converging to a rigid connection, and then as you as you decrease your ply bearing strength, so you get thinner plies, you are uh, moving away from Ka, which means you have a less rigid connection. And now I'll talk about our fastener screw shear models. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the bearing and pullout cases were separated from our fastener shear cases, and here um, we propose a model based on the probability of these fasteners failing in shear. Uh, we fit the same parameters that we did for the backbones, and these are the parameters for each of our specimens, uh, for each of our material types. And this uh, model is very useful for 
probabilistic simulation. So if you have, say, a diaphragm with a set of fasteners at different sides, you can predict using this model at like the probability of which fasteners are going to fail, depending on their side value. And here you can see our plots for the different um, material types. And what you can see is that most of the points are at smaller size. So that means mostly uh, most of the fastener shears occur when you have thick plies in a small fastener. And this makes sense if you think about it, because um, with thick plies and a small fastener, your fastener is your weakest component. So it would be the first thing to fail when you load it. And then we also see here that there is an increase in um, the side values that get shear fasteners for uh, cyclic loading. And we think this is because of uh, with, with cyclic loading, you introduce fatigue loads. And then it leads to um, fracture of the screen. And the last model that I will be talking about is our whole elongation model. So while we were running our cyclic test, and you can see a response here, we noticed that there is this flat portion of the response. And this is related to the slotted hole where the fastener is located elongating the hole. And we denoted this as G in this proposed pinching model. And we hypothesized that this hole elongation has to be related to the loading protocol. So what we're telling the crosshead to move to and where the fastener is supposed to move to, that's how much like the hole should be elongating. And we're assuming that there's a, some linear relationship between these two values. So we denoted this um, as mg. To confirm our hypothesis, we had to pull cycle by cycle data for um, each ply combination. So we took a sample size of plies um, that covered the range of size that we needed. And we would pull out each cycle of the response. And we would measure g positive and g negative. So g positive is. Um, the portion of the response where the fastener is headed towards the positive relative displacement, and G negative is the portion of the response where the fastener is headed towards the negative relative displacement. So once we have this for every cycle, we can plot G versus relative displacement here and fit these two lines. And then we take the slope of these two lines and average them to get our MG. So for example, we have a steel to steel case here, and we got an MG of 1.61 which means we are experiencing 61% more hole elongation than the prescribed relative displacement. I think that's hard to see. But um, the color coding is for the different types of materials. Um, once we have the MG values for a set number of psi, we can plot this. And then we fit a parabola to it. This is our equation. And um, we realize that hole elongation is actually related to the failure modes that we see. So at small side, um, you have strong plies and weak fasteners. So you would expect to see a lot of fastener screw shear. At larger size, you have weak plies and a strong fastener. So you would expect to see um, bearing. And then somewhere in the middle with these uh, middle value, medium values of psi, you would see um, a lot of fastener tilting. And when we, uh, so what this model is saying that when the fastener tilts, you are getting more hole elongation, which makes sense because when the fastener tilts, you are increasing the amount of area that is between the plies and the fastener, and this elongates the hole more, versus when you have um, shear, which is a form of bearing and just pure bearing, your fastener will just stay flat and go to the displacement that um, the protocol is telling you to go to. And this is also demonstrated in our <coughs> plots down here. So I plotted um, a small psi, a medium psi, and a large psi. And you can see, um, the, so these red lines are mg is equal to 1, which means you're just moving at the relative displacement. And the green lines are, are fitted lines to the data. And uh, the green lines for our medium side case have, are a lot steeper than our red lines, which means we're seeing a lot more hole elongation here. And then for our small and large side, um, you can see the green lines are more or less on top of the red lines, which means we're just seeing the, the hole elongation is equal to the relative displacement. For my conclusions, the major conclusion that we made is that this makes a huge step towards um, light steel frame hole building seismic analysis. We've developed three different types of models that can be used with a pinching model in the future. Um, these faster backbone mo models that I talked about um, can be used to predict the backbone parameters for any material connection test. Uh, with the probability fastener shear model, we can determine uh, which fasteners will fail based on their size. For the amount of hole elongation, we realized that this is uh, related to the failure mode, and we developed a model that can help us predict how much hole elongation a ply combination will experience. And experimentally, we propose a test setup that can run any typical connection fastener test and a non-contact optical measurement technique that can accurately measure the relative displacement. And for future work, I would 
recommend um, an additional experimental study. While we did cover a lot of tests in our experimental study, we, you can see that there is a lack of data around these psi values, um, about 45 to 75. So I think um, coming up with an experimental program that covers these psi values will help us produce more accurate models. And the last, last final piece of the puzzle for coform steel connections is cyclic strength and stiffness degradation parameters, as is very important for uh, accurate pitching models. And this is actually currently in progress research.